Again, good morning. Now we have, uh, you know, our keynote speaker and the panelists with uh, with us. As you know, this first uh, session is going to be dedicated to trade shocks and the responses to the to the protectionist uh, threat that, uh, you know, according to almost everybody, is the main risk, the main downside risk for the world uh, world economy. Let me let me introduce rapidly. Uh, you know, first, uh, our keynote sp speaker, Marco Putti, Director General of, uh, uh, of uh, Economic and Financial Issues in the European Commission, one of the main exports of the European economy. And afterwards, uh, our panelists. First, uh, uh, Bozjan Vasle, Governor of the, of the Bank of Slovenia, and colleague of the Governing Council. Secondly, Anita Angeloska Bezoska, Governor of the National Bank of the Republic of North Macedonia. Welcome. Debor Deborah Revoltella, Director of the Economics Department of the European Investment, Investment Bank. And Sergei Guriev, uh, Chief Economist of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Now, well, uh, you know, the, the, the discussion is going to be opened by, by Marco, who is going to make the, 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 the keynote speech. And Marco, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Luis, and go to the podium. Right, thank you very much, uh, the ECB, Luis, to have invited me. Um, great pleasure to be here. Um, Actually, the uh, initial uh, intro uh, speeches of uh, President Draghi and the managing director uh, set the scene uh, uh, very nicely and made my life actually quite a bit easier. Uh, what I'm going to do in, uh, in my uh, speech is basically, in certain cases, to put flesh on the bones of what they have said, and in other cases, putting a bit of bones on the flesh they have uh, um, they have uh, introduced uh, uh, here. Now, the, um, I mean, this conference is about the CZ countries, which includes uh, countries which are, which are already members of the EU, uh, and I will refer to them as uh, EU11, uh, and countries that are candidates, potential candidates for future membership, and countries that do not have uh, such a status. So what I'm going to do also for comparative advantages I will uh, focus uh, mainly on the EU 11 countries, but at the end draw some conclusions also for, for, the, uh, for the others and for the broader region uh, as a whole. Um, EU 11 economies are amongst the most open economies globally, and moreover their trade openness increased, um, and the nature of the trade flows changed rapidly in this millennium, in large part because they joined the EU. I think you see uh, this in, uh, um, in my uh, slide. Um, there are important characteristics of EU 11 countries that are different from those of other countries with similar degrees of trade openness. Uh, their institutions and their social support system systems are less developed than those of small uh, open EU 15 countries, so the old uh, uh, countries of the, uh, of the EU, and their households are much less financial savings to smooth their consumption. As the capacity of an economy to absorb shocks and manage the necessary structural changes greatly depends on the quality of institution and on that of the social support system, this is an important difference within the EU. Um, as trade flows are significantly influenced by decisions of firms on the location of their production and labor migration, these characteristics of the EU11 countries are highly re relevant to understanding how trade and other shocks impact them. Okay, in what follows, I will focus on two closely interrelated aspects of uh, uh, Rabi trade integration and the underlying FDI. So it's, in, on the one hand, the impact on long-term growth potential, and on the other hand, on the degree of resilience of these uh, economies. While most economists would agree on the positive economic effects of closer trade integration at the aggregate level, there is an increasing awareness of the importance of the aspects such, such as income distribution and more broadly equal chances and fairness, 
agglomeration effects and the resulting regional disparities and the increasing prices of housing and regional labor market mismatch, labor migration and the resulting fiscal and social uh, implications. I mean, one of the important lessons of the recent crisis in Europe is that the focus on narrowly, narrowly defined aggregate economic growth and economic resilience is not sufficient to understand the longer term impact of uh, economic shocks. Shocks that stimulate growth, but that can also trigger a crisis. So a broader focus that entails social and political aspects is necessary to understand current developments and to formulate adequate policies. If left unaddressed, uh, negative social trends created by market forces can lead to reform reversals, so that's an important message, reform reversals, temptations, and ultimately to an erosion of growth potential and economic resilience. So the emergence of global value chains, we have heard it from uh, President Draghi and the managing director, changed the nature and the impact of trade integration. So the ICT revolution of the 1990s made it easier, safer, and more profitable for leading firms in advanced countries to, combi to combine their know-how with low-cost labor available in nearby countries. However, as trade costs have further reduced the global, including European, but also extra EU component of value chains is likely to increase. Similarly, as service components of global value chain increases, competitive pressure from global market forces uh, increases. This leads to a constant relocation of the different elements of global value chains, increasing possible reshoring of certain parts to EU15, so the old member states, but also offshoring of core elements of EU15 to EU11 or countries outside the, uh, the EU. So one can expect these complex trends to continue and further strengthen in the future. The process of trade integration and the creation of global value chains also drove a significant inflow of FDI into EU11 countries with import of modern technology and capital deepening, as well as rapid modernization of the product structure, having a positive impact on productivity of local suppliers. I mean, this confirm, uh, confirms recent empirical evidence, which shows that domestic, market is, uh, domestic markets is been in both knowledge spillovers and factor reallocation as a consequence of multinational production. The policy mix that facilitates reallocation includes improving credit access and labor supply, particularly skilled labor, while eliminating regulatory barriers, reforms that have been carried out in uh, CZ countries. As we trade, many of the landline forces that promote FDI were global and uh, geographical proximity helped, but EU accession provided a fertile ground for these forces to work, as, as it helped improve institutions and create a higher degree of legal certainty for investors. This is a point also stressed by the uh, initial uh, speakers. EU-11 countries benefited significantly from the reduction of barriers to trade. A recent paper by Merle Baden and Puris uh, estimates that supplying, um, uh, supplying inputs to a multinational multi uh, uh, just across the border is productivity enhancing only when countries share an EU border. These spillovers effect become even larger and even stronger when borders become seamless, as is the case in the Schengen area. So point estimates imply that an increase of one standard deviation in FDI activity across the border results in, in, a, in a productivity level that is about two and six and six percent higher for cross-border EU and cross-border Schengen effects, respectively. As a result, inwards FDI relative to GDP in EU uh, 11 countries has caught up with the trend observed in the most developed small open economies in the EU and in the world, as, as you can see from my uh, slide uh, here. The same, however, has not been true for up outward 
uh, FDI. And this, as I'll show you later, is a key element in understanding the macroeconomic developments in the case uh, of shocks and in the case of the uh, recent experience with the crisis. As overall capital stock relative to GDP is smaller in EU11 than EU15 countries, the share of FDI in total stock of capital is higher. You can see this in, my, in, in this slide. Put differently, foreign capital and thus foreign influence in the corporate sector is more important in these countries, particularly in their exports or tradable uh, sector. Proximity to Germany and the abundance of a low-cost but relatively skilled labor force made, uh, made EU-11 countries perfect targets for integration into European, mostly German, global value chain. They were at the right place, at the right time, and in the right conditions to benefit from this global process. The closer to the center of gravity, the better for the transport infrastructure, the, and the more so even within uh, countries. So, Increasing FDI has also further accelerated the already strong agglomeration effects and increased the demand for and the wage premium on higher skills. FDI is highly concentrated in main uh, urban areas, particularly in capitals and in areas that are close to the main West European man manufacturing firms creating um, global value chain. So as the, my next slide here shows, FDI is particularly high around capital cities, such as Warsaw, Prague, Bratislava. These are the green uh, colored areas. And in areas close to Germany with, uh, with urban centers, uh, this is the case of Gyor in Hungary, where Audi has its main production site. So large differences exist within uh, uh, countries. For example, between the region where Warsaw, Warsaw is in uh, uh, Poland, where FDI relative to GDP is very high, and, and this is in green, and the mostly rural region, region surrounding, um, surrounding this region, where FDI relative to GDP is very low. So, and you can see in the chart, these are in, uh, in black. As my next slide shows here, actually borrowing from the, from the EBRD, trimming actually uh, a bit your, uh, your figure, um, but uh, it's, that's what comes from, uh, from your report. Uh, the creation of global value chain had a uh, major agglomeration effect also in the countries in which the firms creating global value chains are located, most visibly in Germany. So the location of newly created jobs seems to be rather different from that of the eliminated ones. As a result, decline in localized product, uh, population density is as strong in the middle Germany, also in the western part, as is in uh, some of the regions in the CZ countries. So the process of trade integration and the creation of global value chains have major social and political implications, not only in these countries, but also in uh, countries of uh, all countries of the EU, even in the highly successful ones. I mean, one of the salient characteristics of the crisis experience, uh, uh, so the, the, um, uh, uh, the um, recent financial crisis uh, of EU11 countries was that in many of these countries, the decline in domestic demand was actually much bigger relative to, to the decline in GDP uh, um, than in the core EU uh, countries. Um, with the help of a calibrated DSG model, we can pinpoint to two important characteristics of uh, EU-11 countries that can explain a large part of this phenomenon, which is certainly multidimensional, um, and will, uh, I think, remain relevant moving forward. The first one is the high share of foreign ownership of, of um, productive capacity without a, comparative, a comparable magnitude of outward FDI. So this is the first element. The second element is a large share of hand-to-mouth consumers, that is people who have little savings and thus have to, leave, to live uh, out of their current income, which is partly a consequence of the first characteristic. So these two um, elements are important. As, combined, uh, as a combined effect of these two characteristics, the income share of unconstrained households whose consumption would, real less, would re react less to shocks is significantly lower 
in uh, uh, CZ countries compared to the old uh, EU15 economy. So uh, you, you can see that, uh, you can see in these charts, these characteristics have important implications on how the economy reacts to a global recessionary shocks, uh, shock in an EU economy with high foreign ownership of productive assets relative to an um, EU uh, 15 economy and, relatively, and relative to uh, the somewhat hypothetical case of an EU 11 economy without, without sizable foreign ownership. So domestic demand, particularly consumption, declined considerably more sharply in, the, in these countries. And the decline in investment, also you can see from the chart, is somewhat bigger, reflecting the accelerator effect of higher consumption decline. Given the high share of non-tradables uh, in uh, consumptions, um, a much larger decline uh, in consumption, which is uh, not fully passed on to uh, imports, implies that the non-tradable sectors decline much more in new 11 economy with sizable foreign ownership. Moreover, despite relatively flexible labor market, hysteresis remains significant and equally important investment recover considerably more gradually. In short, you put all these elements uh, together, growth potential may be reduced more. So not only actual production, but also potential output can be more volatile than in more mature uh, economies. And I think you can see uh, here, this seems to be the case in my uh, next uh, slide. So if we add up these two effects, i.e. a bigger shock to the non-tradable sector and a renewed uh, reallocation of modern export-oriented production um, uh, in EU 11 countries, the outcome is that winners win even more and losers lose even more. So the growth potential at the aggregate level may have been largely restored. You can see actually the uh, growth potential going uh, up in my, um, in my chart, but the vulnerabilities I discussed above have actually increased. In the absence of an efficient state with high quality public expenditure and the social, and social support system, this may destabilize societies and domestic politics. The emergence of reform reversal in the region is a likely manifestation of this impact. In the charts I show uh, earlier, so which was slide, uh, chart slide, the models incorporated exchange rate flexibility. So it's a shock with exchange rate flexibility. Flexible exchange rate regimes, especially when they are allowed to work, can help absorb external shocks and can be particularly helpful when external shocks are, are symmetric. Uh, this is also confirmed by our model uh, simulation. I have some charts here that, uh, in the background that if you like to uh, see them later. Um, uh, if this is taken away, the volatility of output becomes somewhat bigger. A change rate regimes we have seen in the past uh, uh, several years in CZ regions have continuously moved towards the two extremes, floating and fixed regimes, and EU 11 countries with the uh, latter regime, with the exception of, um, of Bulgaria, uh, with the exception of Bulgaria, have uh, already joined uh, the euro area, and Bulgaria has applied for entering ERM uh, 2. Regarding the EU um, 11 countries that have not yet joined the euro area or expressed interest to do so, they have floating rates and adjustment tools at their disposal. I think it served them well. Um, during the crisis, albeit could not eliminate the consequences of poor policies. I think this is an important message. Uh, exchange rate cannot compensate uh, uh, policy, important policy uh, mistakes. Moreover, with foreign exchange denominated loans greatly reduced now in the aftermath of the crisis, they can use exchange rate flexibility more than before the crisis. But like during the crisis, exchange rate flexibility will not be a panacea for poor macroeconomic policies and lack of structural reforms, actually just the opposite. With poor policies, the volatility of the exchange rate can well aggravate the situation. So let me move to the uh, policy options moving forward. Um, policy options to react to trade shocks can range from short terminism of uh, uh, protecting rents tied to vested interests to, on the opposite side, long-term 
A strategy is consisting of adopting appropriate structural reforms and enhancing the quality of the institutions to retain the position of an attractive investment destination, but also for moving up the value chain and leapfrogging. We see these different responses simultaneously present in the current situation in the world. Here, uh, Mrs. Lagarde uh, mentioned this. Trade protectionism of any form would be particularly detrimental for CZ uh, countries. And this is well understood in these countries. What is perhaps less well understood by some policymakers in these countries is that restrictions on foreign entry uh, of FDI in the non-tradable sector, such as, such as retail trade, and sectors that are less exposed to competition from the outside, so certain service sectors, also reduce their competitiveness and capacity to attract FDI in the tradable sector. So there is an interplay here between tradable and non-tradable sectors. Success in attracting FDI um, is certainly important for potential growth uh, looking forward, but make also CZ countries more vulnerable to external shocks, as I try to uh, illustrate in the model simulation. Therefore, the right balance and sequencing of reforms is needed to make the convergence not only fast, but also sustainable, uh, which is economically, socially, but also politically. As you can see in my final slide, uh, given the strong um, exposure to global shocks, social policy reform should address all three dimensions, pre-market, in-market, and post-market, to make CZ countries more socially and thus politically more resilient. Institutional reforms are key on all fronts and can also help build capacity and use EU funds more efficiently. Continued capital imports will remain a necessary element of a development strategy and risk diversification is essential for such a small and highly spe specialized open economies. The crisis clearly demonstrated the vulnerability of debt financing, those that, uh, reforms that can reduce these vulnerabilities, such, a, such as completion of banking union, reforms that can make alternative source of finance more easily available, such as the completion, completion of capital markets union, are essential part of this strategy. So a lot is requested uh, in terms of domestic reforms for the, these countries, but a number of reforms at the EU level are also uh, conducive to uh, stronger resilience and catching up in these countries. So most of what I have said so far applies also to countries in the CZ re region that are not yet EU member states, but which are as candidate or potential candidate at different stages of the EU accession process. As the experience of EU 11 countries shows, the prospects of future EU membership constitu constitutes an important anchor for political, economic, and institutional reforms. It can accelerate trade integration, FDI inflows and increase the participation in global value chains, and so do national reforms. In fact, comprehensive reforms are indispensable to comply with the criteria for future EU membership, that the but the opposite is also uh, true. Slowing down reforms, or worse, reversing them, makes the EU membership a more distant option and makes these countries less de desirable for FDI. Hence, the central law of reforms for CZ, uh, CZ countries uh, is confirmed. Infrastructure is also crucial as the type of FDI and the part of, glo of the global value chain that are likely to move to this part of Europe at this stage of development heavily relies on transportation. The other side of the coin is that increased vulnerability and, and strong agglomeration effects and incl uh, including outward migration for the region is uh, equally if not more important uh, to bear in mind for these countries. So to conclude, to maintain the high growth potential of these countries and thus to support rapid and sustainable convergence that meets the expectations of the people in this part of the world, CZ countries should make themselves ready to benefit from the new trends in, global, in the global and the European economy. However, success on this front, on this front will expose them even more to global shocks and make them more vulnerable on other fronts. Therefore, 
They need to learn to live with them better by increasing their economic, social, and political resilience to these shocks. This is also in the best interest of the EU as a whole, and reforms at the EU level can also help with this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. You have made a, a comprehensive presentation that I think that is going to be very useful because you have covered all the important uh, elements of the discussion that we're going to have uh, afterwards, uh, starting with the common features of these CC uh, economies and with uh, you know, some policy recommendations that for sure are going to give rise to uh, you know, a debate afterwards. So uh, now, uh, well, uh, we are going to open the, the, the floor to the panelists. Uh, you are going to have each of, uh, each of you uh, seven minutes for your presentations. I will start with, uh, we will start with Bozjan Basli, hmm? the, the, the governor of the Central Bank of Slovenia and also a member of the governing council. Uh, <clears throat> so good morning, uh, dear friends, and uh, Thank you for uh, having me here at this very distinguished panel and also very interesting one, uh, namely, as uh, was already uh, emphasized today, uh, two or three decades ago, a uh, majority of our economies decided to um, change our economies uh, to build a new uh, growth model, which was very much based on uh, openness of our economies and uh, hence on uh, international uh, trade. And of course, uh, when there are some adverse uh, shocks into this area, it's uh, influencing uh, all of us uh, quite significantly. So for the purpose of uh, this presentation, I, I prepared a few slides and uh, I uh, uh, split uh, countries we are talking about today. So see countries in two groups. The first one are these who already adopted Euro and then the rest of them. And as you can uh, quite clearly see here, the growth model based on trade and openness and majority of uh, countries, the countries almost uh, doubled the uh, export uh, market share in less than two decades, as opposed to, to the controlling group of countries, which are uh, Euro area uh, member states, which are not included in the, in the first group. So, uh, even more, um, this is even more true for the countries uh, who adopted Euro, which are benefiting from EU membership and also reflecting the, the, the fact that uh, trade is uh, inside this block is very EU oriented. So looking at the same phenomenon from, the, from other angles uh, through, uh, through uh, global value chains, and I prepared here a measure of global value chain part participation, which is based on the sum of uh, downstream participation and uh, upstream participation, and it's measured as a share of uh, gross exports. Now, you can see that uh, there is an increasing trend in all three uh, group of countries, but uh, still the, the highest, uh, the highest uh, integration is uh, visible for uh, Euro area countries inside this block and for uh, non-Euro area CZ countries uh, as well. And what is uh, also important is that uh, upstream participation, which is basically a measuring portion of uh, export uh, used by another country in the production of their exports, is on the upward trend, and also downstream participation is also on the upward trend, and this downstream participation is basically measuring the content of uh, import into our exports. So what is even more uh, important uh, for us is that not only volumes, but also the quality of uh, exports uh, is uh, improving. As you can clearly see, uh, almost uh, or more than 40% of, uh, of increase is due to high tech in uh, CZ uh, Euro area countries. And then there is an increase in the medium high tech, which is also at around one third almost, and then decrease in medium low tech and even higher degrees in low tech. And the same is true for CZ non-Euro area countries, whereas the, the situation in uh, Euro area countries is quite a different. High tech is on the downward trend and medium tech is on the upper trend. However, looking at the absolute levels, uh, CZ countries are still slightly behind the EU 12, uh, 12 group. 
the drivers uh, which are behind uh, these developments, so behind GDP growth and also export growth, are, as you can see, uh, very different in uh, these two group of countries. On one side, in CZ countries, there is a huge, uh, huge uh, contribution of increased productivity, whereas uh, employment is the main driver of uh, growth in, in uh, Euro area countries uh, which are not in CZ block. So the quality, one, one can, one can uh, understand this as an improvement, additional improvement in the quality of uh, GDP decomposition and also in the export uh, decomposition. <coughs> and uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, a real uh, unit labor costs also decreased in, in the CZ group as a whole, as opposed uh, to to EU area where there is only a small decrease, but there are some differences between the countries which already adopted Euro and those which has, has not. And uh, you can see that there is a difference between the productivity and uh, compensation for employee. And uh, yes, one can interpret this uh, result that the higher wage growth is also, also has uh, some uh, improvement uh, of uh, related to the living cost standards, or, although there is a deterioration in the uh, unit labor cost developments. So what can we do at the end of the day uh, when there is a negative shock uh, coming from the international trade and going basically directly to the, our growth model? Uh, it was already mentioned that uh, when we are talking about the short-term prospects, there is actually very little we can do. But when we are thinking uh, medium term or longer term, there are, uh, <coughs> of course, the whole area of uh, structural reforms which can uh, help to, to mitigate these uh, negative developments. Uh, and uh, there are basically two areas I would like to emphasize. The first one is uh, productivity, and the second one is uh, improvement in technological structure. Namely, the productivity grow is, growth is the main driver of our uh, GDP and our export, and implementing measures to improve uh, this productivity levels and growth will, of course, contribute to the overall result. And we can, uh, it was already mentioned, do here uh, several things. Uh, I may start with uh, improvement in education, improvement in the labor market, so distribution of effects inside the labor market. There is a field of research and development and also uh, innovation, which can be reached through the prudent investments, which can also have positive effects on the mix of, of policy mix we are currently seeing in, in EU area and in these countries as well, because if there are countries with uh, enough uh, fiscal space, it can have positive effects for the policy mix as well. And of course, uh, there is also a area, broad area of uh, red type of different measures which are not very supportive to the, to the performance of our economy and can be addressed in order to improve this uh, performance. Now, uh, just to, to end it, uh, the one, one area, of reform is also related to deeper EU integration, namely if we are, which we are probably not in a position to influence significantly the overall flows on the global level, we can do much in terms of, uh, of uh, block we are living in. And by this, I mean uh, completion of the banking and capital union, which can help to, to, to improve the situation in, in the Euro area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next panelist is. Uh, I don't have slides. Should I speak from here? Yeah, well, you know, you can speak here from here. Okay. So as well, you know. No, no, I'm not. Thank you. Okay, first of all, uh, let me thank you for the invitation. It's really a pleasure being here and having the possibility to reflect on the challenges that small and open economies such as North Macedonia faced in the new global trade uh, context. I was asked to more reflect from the perspective of the North Macedonia as a specific small uh, economy. So um, North Macedonia is a small and open economy where, uh, we, which is uh, characterized by high trade and financial openness, which accounts more than 100% of GDP, which in principle means that's an economy that is subject to different kind of external shocks that can easily transmit in the domestic economy, affect different segments of the economy, and especially given the monetary regime of de facto fixed exchange rate, which means that in principle room for accommodative monetary policy depends to a critical extent on external environment that it's its implication and the level on the official uh, reserves. 
Um, looking at uh, developments in the region, trade integration in the region, it's clear that it has started accelerating at early years of transition, as was our case, of course, underpinned by implementation of a lot of structural reforms, trade liberalization, uh, elimination of different kinds of trade barriers, but it has been particularly rapid in the period preceding the global crisis. Uh, to a great extent, it can be explained by the abandoned capital inflows that will present in a region, uh, fueling consumption, fueling ex import, and to some extent also uh, due to higher FDIs in the region, fueling the export from, from the region. Uh, in the post-crisis period, in the context of downward adjustment of the capital inflows in the region and weaker global outlook, uh, there has been a slowing down of the trade integration, uh, integration almost across all countries in the, in the region. Uh, however, um, we have followed, uh, our pattern has a lot of similarities with this pattern, but also some differences. One notable difference is that, in fact, in the pre-crisis period, our pace of trade integration was slower, and then it significantly accelerated in the post-crisis period. What can explain this deviation from the com a common trend? First of all, we didn't face abandoned capital inflows in the pre-crisis period, which means that we had a more moderate cycle on average. Uh, second, in a post-crisis period, um, uh, a lot of reforms, especially in the segment of the business environment, were stepped up, which was at which is also visible uh, de facto through different kind of indicators. For example, doing business indicators where the country currently is ranked at the 10th position. Of course, there are many things still to be done, but uh, de facto these uh, changes were conducive to FDIs, maybe not such sizable FDIs, but what is, has been very important for us FDIs in the tradable sector, it has been mostly in the automobile industry, investments that have started operating in the free economic zones operated, uh, opened by the government. This process for our economy has uh, brought a lot of uh, benefits. First of all, it has increased the competitiveness, which is clearly visible through different pattern of development of productivity and competitiveness in the segments that were faced with the FDI and different pa pattern in the other segments of our economy. Then also it changed the structure of the economy. It uh, changed the uh, export structure, uh, reducing our resilience on two dominant segments, uh, which are uh, low-value-added segments, such as textile and metal industry. It also had other spillover effects through, through the rest of the economy, and what is very important for us is that this process meant a durable way of financing the growth, because growth was mainly driven by FDI, stable AF inflows that increase our financial, uh, financial openness, but in a way it was financed by strong, by more reliable and stable, um, stable inflows. Uh, so, um, on the one hand, overall, it meant, looking from a more broader perspective, this process meant improvement of our fundamentals, which can mean stronger economy to deal with any potential shocks. But on the other hand, it also meant increased vulnerability of the economy because trade openness significantly increased. Of course, it's not the case only with our economy. If I look at the data across the region, trade openness has significantly increased across all countries in the region, though uh, and uh, dominantly it has been driven by the, by the export uh, segment. Uh, so in this context, when we are faced with such high openness, and not just trade, but also financial openness, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, faced with really, in, in the current environment, we are faced with a lot of challenges. Um, de facto, to what extent one economy is vulnerable uh, to external environment, of course, it doesn't depend only on the level of the trade openness. It depends on the structure, export concentration, export sophistication, uh, but it also depends on the financial openness, level of financial openness, because these trade shocks can translate also to financial markets through the confidence channel and have more broader uh, uh, worsening of the perspectives to the, uh, to the region. It also will depend a lot on the reaction on the financial markets. It will depend on um, uh, 
policy room to react on such uh, developments. And looking the data across the region, although there are similar trends, I would say that there are still a lot of differences across countries. Even purely looking just trade openness, in this region trade openness uh, ranges from 60% of GDP to 180% of GDP with quite different structures inside, quite different level of exposure, for example, to global value change. And in fact, global value change, the level of their present, I mean, can significantly amplify the effect because all of the reasons that were uh, discussed uh, so far. Looking at the financial openness, even the, the difference is, is bigger. It ranges from 100% of GDP, when I speak about financial openness, I take into account financial assets and financial abilities, to up to 300% percent of GDP. So quite uh, differences across, uh, across uh, countries. Uh, in our case, what is important, um, in a de facto, we are um, heavily exposed to developments to the European Union. As was mentioned by Ms. Lagarde, yes, we are not directly exposed to uh, US economy, Chinese economy. We are not exporting directly the automobiles in these economies, but indirectly we're, we can be significantly hit. For example, we have reduced the resilience I mentioned to some traditional industries, but we have significantly incre increased the dependence on aut automobile industry. For example, our export of automobile industry now accounts roughly 50% of our export. It's mostly global value chains, it's mostly German. So we heavily depend not on domestic demand in the EU, but external demand for the EU uh, products. In this uh, context, uh, what is important for us small uh, as a small economy, other economies in the region as well, is to strengthen the resilience of the economy. And to strengthen the resilience of the economy, despite pursuing with sound macroeconomic policies, which means building policy buffers to be able to better confront with any uh, shocks. Also continuing with the structural reforms in the region that are key for increasing the productivity. Productivity in the whole region accounts on average 60% from the product, uh, German productivity. In our case, it's even worse, just 44% of the German productivity. And this is a key because we will have to fight for a smaller piece of the trade pie, which will be smaller now. So competitiveness even now gets more, needs to get more uh, attention. And there are a couple of specific segments that I think also deserve attention. In our specific case, uh, we have to structure uh, policies in a way to reduce the concentration on any industry, being also industry which has a high value, reducing concentration on countries. We are also, um, uh, con our export is also concentrated with Germany, although good side of this, this is an economy with good fundamentals. We still, uh, export sophistication has increased, but still there is a long way uh, to go. And regional trade, not to forget the regional trade. Regional trade, I looked at it, I was even surprised. I was not, I know that it was declining. I thought that it's more in relative term because we are now becoming more exposed to, to EU uh, as part of the global value chains. But even in nominal terms, regional trade has been uh, declining. And this can offer a lot of benefits for region as a whole. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anita. Our third uh, panelist is Deborah. Thank you very much, and uh, again, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to um, to be a panelist in this uh, very interesting uh, debate, and. Uh, uh, I think uh, at this stage I will just mention uh, the, the key messages and then uh, move to the second part of the presentation. I think uh, we have elaborated a lot on the first part of the message that I had, so I don't want to repeat uh, too much. The, the main message that, uh, that uh, I wanted to bring to the table is that a centralist in Europe uh, is a, um, is a group of open economies uh, we're integrated in the global value change, chains. We heard already that uh, um, they have increased uh, very much their sensitivities to shocks, 
Die, uh, die key fact is uh, that in the last years, that structural factors have prevailed with the structural factors being very much the European integration and the global the integration in the, the global value chains. So these structural factors have somehow covered the very strong sensitivity to potential trade stock. But the challenge is the challenge of the future, and this is the part where I will mostly focus. And the challenge are uh, really, really related to the, um, the structural factor like the globalization, technological change, aging and outward migration, as we heard this morning uh, already. And these are the elements uh, that uh, uh, should be at the core of the policy action in the region uh, to guarantee continued productivity growth. So the, the, the key answer to me are uh, working on uh, removing a structural impediment, mostly on the business environment, working on skills, uh, working on digitalization innovation, and working on finance for innovation. So I skipped the first part where I was uh, uh, taking, talking about uh, the structural trend of uh, integration in the global, uh, in the European integration and the global value change and then uh, in global uh, trade, despite the dynamics uh, in world trade. I only keep uh, one element of, uh, of this, uh, that is uh, when uh, we use uh, firm level data and also survey data that uh, we collect at the EIB to look at uh, the exporter premium. And we see that uh, the exporter premium is uh, quite re relevant in the region. The exporters end up uh, being uh, much more productive, uh, much more innovating. Uh, they, they end up uh, having a stronger growth, stronger financials, uh, and being uh, less uh, finance constrained. So in fact, at uh, the micro level, uh, we see that uh, uh, being an exporter has been uh, giving a premium to firms and leading uh, to faster uh, transformation. But uh, I switch to the second part, so the structural challenge ahead and uh, the policy challenge for the region. Again, I look uh, at uh, uh, micro data, firm level data, and uh, partly related to a survey that we run at the European Investment Bank. We ask uh, which are uh, the key, key structural impediments uh, to firm uh, for their investment decision. And in the region, uh, we see a number of impediments, and some are much stronger than uh, at the European level uh, overall. The first one is skills, but I elaborate on this uh, later. The first, the, the, the second and third one uh, are uh, uh, labor uh, regulation and business regulation uh, that in the region uh, weight more uh, than at the European level overall. This is quite important because the labor market regulation and the business regulation as an impediment to firm are impeding the transformation and the reallocation of resources. So they impede the natural change needed in order to have more innovativeness and more dynamism in the economy. And this is something quite important on a policy point of view where structural rigidities are still part of, um, of uh, the normalities in some of uh, uh, the countries in the region. I go back to the first impediment, and uh, the first impediment for investment in the region is uh, still related uh, to availability of skills. We have done analysis, and I'm sure that uh, Sergey will continue on the topic. There is a strong component related to the outward migration from the region, which is one of uh, the important elements. And it also calls into question whether Europe, with an integrated labor market, should have more coordination in terms of, uh, um, of uh, uh, skills policy at the European level. But the issue of skill is, uh, is important on the one side because of aging, because of the outward migration, but also because it's uh, uh, posing a particular constraint to the technological transformation of the region. What we see is, uh, again coming from our own survey, that particularly certain skills are lacking in a global market where top skills move 
uh, to Europe, to the US, uh, to other countries, uh, the region is uh, really starting to lack what was uh, one of the key elements of the region uh, was really to come out uh, from a communist time uh, with a very strong uh, um, uh, STEM skills. And uh, this is now changing because of the outward uh, migration uh, part. And uh, also what we find uh, is uh, that the firms uh, that are uh, more innovative are those are complaining uh, uh, the, more, uh, the most uh, for uh, lack of skills. These uh, skill issues, uh, again, is uh, very important also because uh, the technological transformation is uh, generating uh, um, substantial change in the labor market with a number of jobs uh, being uh, at a risk of uh, transformation. And uh, if you don't have the higher skills level and if you don't have the incentive for, invest, for generating the year, year skill level, the positive part of the technological change and digitalization, that is the grow enhancing part and the labor generating enhancing part, can be compromised. So the digitalization process in the region can lead only to destruction of jobs rather than creation of new jobs. Um, I switch to the second point where policy action is uh, quite important and is related to digitalization. And uh, again, uh, through our survey, we compare uh, European and US firms and we look at uh, the level of digitalization. What we see is uh, that uh, Europe and Central Eastern Europe uh, as well seems to be some or, uh, more or less at a par with the US in terms of uh, digitalization in manufacturing is lagging behind in the service sector and Central Eastern Europe more than the rest of Europe. What is interesting is also to look at uh, which firm are la lagging at uh, the European level, it's a lot of uh, the, small, the small and the micro firms in Central Eastern Europe is a little bit more also of uh, the medium and large firms. Why lagging behind in digitalization is an issue? The issue is uh, that uh, lagging behind in digitalization may have uh, a permanent cost in terms of productivity. There may be um, winner takes all issues that uh, will generate uh, this delay to, to have a cost for the society that is a long-term cost for the society. So moving forward uh, on that point of view on uh, spurring digitalization is quite important for the region. And this is a com European Commission indicator of uh, digitalization readiness and you would see most of the Central Eastern European countries quite on the right side. I am almost at the last two messages on uh, innovation, uh, smart environment. Uh, what we see is uh, that the region uh, again is lagging behind in innovation capacity. The first uh, graph is showing uh, um, a way in which we cluster firms according to uh, whether firms are not investing in R&D and not innovating, those are the basic, then adopting are not doing R&D but are adopting technology, and the other ones are doing R&D and uh, they are innovating. What you see is a Central Eastern Europe is lagging behind a much more basic firm, some adoption and much less of the active innovator firms. So spurring the innovation side is quite important. On the other side, we built an indication of a smartness of region. It comes from a number of indicators at the regional level on what, are, what does it mean to be a smart region. And here what you see, Central Eastern Europe is lagging behind and with the very strong discrepancy with capital cities, uh, regions versus the rest. So is, uh, is again another message in terms of pushing more for innovation. Financing for innovation, I couldn't work at the EIB if at this stage I don't talk about financing for innovation. And also with my yet of the Vienna Initiative, we are developing a working group really looking at what's happening to finance for innovation in the region. Um, there is a, a relatively low public sector prioritization for innovation financing, and this is a showing in terms of public sector policies in the direction. And on the other side, the private sector is very used to grants, so there is a lot of dependency to grants. And this brings some challenge in terms of building a normal, normal framework for financing innovation. 
on top of that, the very much bank-based financial system is situated ill-suited to support innovation, and there are some uh, niche for experimentation in the region, in Bulgaria and Romania, the banking are trying to do something more in terms of uh, taking risk, uh, supporting innovation, but those are uh, extremely small. There is a venture capital market that is uh, slowly maturing, uh, some, somehow um, more mature in some of the countries, but is quite isolated and there is a low integration of this venture capital market with the global pan-European markets. And then again, also the pan-European venture capital market is not the best example of leading a firm to, toward the wool of the growth phase. There are some new things, also guarantee schemes that can help in financing innovation and venture debt as a new option, but still in terms of financing innovation, there is a lot of work to do also on a policy point of view to try to have more going on. So the last message, I think that the challenges so far are structural. The region has to work more on this structural element, structural impediment, business environment, skilling and reskilling, innovation, advancement of digitalization, and then finance for innovation. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah. Um, finally, last but not least, Sergei, you have to go. Thank you very much, Luis. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this distinguished uh, conference. Indeed, uh, uh, much of what I wanted to say has already been said, and that's why I'm not showing slides, because my slides would literally show the same data, the same trends as uh, people who have talked with and without slides before me. I will, uh, like everybody else, uh, uh, say what we think about the uh, last uh, couple of decades, kind of taking stock of convergence and integrating in the global economy of uh, uh, CC region. Uh, I will also talk about newly emerging ch challenges and why it is hard to address those challenges. So in terms of taking stock, convergence has indeed progressed. FDI has actually been ahead of other emerging markets. Uh, global value chain integration has been very impressive. Most of those trends, however, peaked uh, before the crisis. In the last 10 years, uh, further growth of trade and value chain integration has been stagnating. FDI is not as high as before the crisis. And convergence still is going on, but is slowing down. But the levels achieved before the crisis, which are now stagnating, are indeed impressive. So if we think about CC economies, these are countries where 50% where of exports are imports. So the content of import, exports due to imports is higher than in other EU countries and is even higher than in Asian champions of uh, global value chains, such as uh, Korea and Malaysia. Part of that is, of course, because these countries are small. They have to integrate into global value chains. Otherwise, uh, uh, they cannot grow. But it is impressive that if you look at global value chains index, if you look at import content of exports, all of these countries are above EU average, with possible uh, ex ex uh, exception of Croatia. Probably this is why the IMF conference in Croatia in July will focus on other issues, on demographics this year and two years ago on governance. So, uh, but still, it is, it is the region which depends on trade, which is a major recipient of European FDI, and it is an essential part of factory Europe. Now, that brings us to uh, the challenges which emerge as we speak. Madame Lagarde talked about those challenges. Uh, the trade wars are emerging. Brexit is still on the agenda, whether we like it or not. Uh, and uh, the question is to what extent our economies are, uh, CC economies are resilient to those. Well, first and foremost, of course, the trade wars will not directly affect those economies, as Madame Lagarde was talking about, because these economies are not exporting to US and China directly. They're part of factory Europe. And we do not foresee trade wars within Europe. At least we attach zero probability to those events. Uh, we see that, however, the indirect effects may be large, and this is what Christine was uh, very 
precisely indicating that uh, if you export to Germany and then Germany exports to China, and if China is hit by the trade wars and slows down, then the indirect effects may be substantial. And this is, of course, a major challenge. And this is a joint challenge, not just for the region, but for the whole uh, European Union. I should say that here we talk about CC, but this is also a challenge for many of other countries we work in. They're also integrated. The countries in the neighborhood are also integrated in European economic space, being a part of customs union, such as Turkey, being uh, members of DCFTA with Europe, such as Ukraine and Georgia. But uh, since we focus on CC, uh, let me talk about this. The second major challenge is, of course, automation and robotization. Uh, that may result in reshoring of jobs, and we already observed that happening. Uh, we see that this region, as Madame Lagarde was saying, is aging and aging rapidly, and this is what we talk about in our latest transition report. Uh, this region is, if you like, the aging capital of emerging markets. It's behind Western economies in terms of aging, but outside of the advanced economies, areas, this is the region where aging is happening as fast, uh, faster than anywhere else. When you have aging, you have robots. There is a very uh, strong and robust relationship between the age of median worker and number of robots per capita, but in those terms, actually, our economies are behind the West, behind Western European countries, with the exceptions of Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Hungary. In other economies, for the same age and composition of the labor force, we see fewer robots, significantly fewer robots than in the West. And that, of course, is a challenge because when you have robots in Germany, Germany no longer cares that much of wages, and therefore jobs may move from uh, Central Europe, Southern Europe to Germany, back to Germany. This is what Marka called reshoring. Now, the next challenge is uh, the implication of success of convergence. As convergence is happening, Incomes are going up, wages are going up. And so the advantage of low-cost skilled labor is no longer as important. And so you need to find a new growth model. As jobs are moving further on to low-wage destinations such as southern and eastern Mediterranean, for example, on some areas of Turkey, and, uh, or Ukraine, as I mentioned, or Georgia. And in that sense, the challenge of creating new uh, structure of growth model, new growth paradigm is there. So how do countries can respond to those new challenges? Well, uh, this is what uh, everybody has talked about, skills, innovation, quality of governance, quality of bureaucracy, quality of policy making. Where do our countries rank on this? Well, these countries still have strong skills. So this is something which uh, I actually didn't expect to find. But when we looked at skills using all the wealth of data on both quantity and quality, we were expecting to find that these countries have huge quality of skills, which is true. Our countries still have a lot of, uh, sorry, quantity of skills, the huge quantity. We still have a lot of people with higher education uh, due to the expansion of higher education in the last 20 years, not just before the transition. However, what I was surprised to see is that quality is actually quite high still. And whether you use OECD data, for example, PIAC data, or World Bank data, for example, STEP data, whether you use a World Bank Human Capital Project that looks at all measures of quality of education, even if when, when you look at quality or uh, quality-adjusted quantity, these countries are still quite skilled. And this is important, why? Uh, because also, when we talk about uh, reform reversals, political pushback, uh, of globalization. In these countries, globalization remains popular. Why? Because skilled people see benefits of creating middle skill and high skill jobs. And this is what the research we are doing at the BRD, where we look at the skill composition of trade and political approval, support of globalization in different countries. We see very clearly that if you have uh, skilled experts going up and skilled imports going down, then the skilled workers actually support such globalization, while low-skilled workers, of course, resist such globalization. Now, in terms of governance and institutions, this is the region where, relative to countries with similar incomes, quality of governance is low. 
And uh, previous speakers mentioned specific countries, but I just can tell you that on average, in most of our countries, quality of institutions are actually low relative to countries with similar income levels. Now, if you ask me, say, a couple of years ago, I would say, for example, in Bali countries, governance is amazingly high. But then we've also had scandals there as well. So another issue is innovation. So these countries have uh, uh, actually achieved convergence, but they've not built sustainable innovation systems. And uh, yeah, I still have uh, a minute. Um, uh, this is a very interesting process that we've observed in the last couple of decades where incomes have grown, but number of patents have not grown. Number of innovative businesses has actually lagged behind. If you compare to countries, other middle income, upper middle income countries such as Korea, Israel, uh, China, and Turkey, which have grown and in the process also built uh, innovation. Our countries, in comparable measures, lag behind. That may be because of a top-down culture of communist legacy. That may be because of aging. I'm not an ageist person, and I'm also above uh, middle age even in my own country. Uh, but I think younger people innovate more, not because they're better, but simply because they have longer horizon in front of them, so they're more likely to be willing to take risks. Another issue is, of course, brain drain and emigration, something that has been mentioned today a lot. And in our countries, aging is actually aggravated by brain drain. And of course, smarter and more inno innovative people are moving to countries where returns to innovation are higher, such as UK, Germany, and the US. And in our transition report, we evaluate the cost of such brain drain, and we show that the cost is high. And we show that firms and industries that were affected by uh, outflow of skilled workers uh, have lost uh, something like 20 percentage points of TFP. On the other hand, uh, knowledge flows back. So when Polish workers go to Germany, German patents get cited in Poland. This is something that we also see, which may be whether good or bad, depends how you look at this. But uh, we do observe remittances not just being financial, but also knowledge remittances. Now, the good news is these countries uh, remain destinations of FDI. And we show that FDI helps to promote resilience to trade shocks and uh, other, uh, other external shocks. Uh, and uh, in that sense, there is a reason of optimism. Now, uh, where I would like to conclude is the need for research. We still need a lot more granular data. And we will we'll continue exploring which firms are doing better um, in terms of responding to such shocks. Uh, uh, what we've been talking about today is innovation, skills, uh, foreign direct investment, access to markets, integration of global value chains are important issues which may bring both costs and benefits. And so we need granular data. Now, the good news is, uh, as uh, Deborah mentioned, we now have a uh, new enterprise survey in the field, BIPS, uh, Business Environment and Enterprise Performance Survey, the first time we do it not just with, with the World Bank, but uh, with the EIB in 40 countries. And so I guess the, in the next conference, we'll have very granular data on these particular issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think that we have, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, listened to all the, the interventions, and we have a very complete and comprehensive uh, uh, elements uh, uh, about uh, the performance and the impediments and the policy recommendations for these CC countries that I think that are going to be, you know, quite relevant for the debate that we are going to have afterwards. Thank you very much because you have adjusted to the. To the, to, the, to, the, to the timing that uh, we are scheduled. And now we have 40 minutes of debate. I'm going to open the floor for everybody uh, around uh, the, the table. I have to ask uh, the cameras to stop filming as well. And uh, well, now the floor, the floor is open for the, if you want to